the end torus, and the inverse image has to be, you know, like it has to, we have to be able to evenly cover. And and so the it's literally just what we've already done, just component by component, two pi t one, two pi i t two e to the 2 pi i t n. And this example serves to illustrate the general theorem. If you have um, I mean, you could, you could generalize this. If you had a space 1 covered by a space 2, um, let's say, you know, let's say you had x1 covered by e1, x2 covered by e2, x3 covered by e3, and so forth, you just form the Cartesian product of the covering maps. Like let P be P1 cross P2 cross P3 and so forth. And the Cartesian product of the covering maps would itself be a covering map for the product. Because those details work out for the product. Yes? For infinite products, I don't know. This is a good question, though. Um, I do not know. There are many things I do not know, though. That is just one of them. So, are there infinitely many things I don't know? Probably. Countably infinite. I think you can argue that the things I don't know are countably infinite, but then that becomes a point of mathematical philosophy. Do you believe that things that are not known are known, even if they're not known by humans? Ah, yes, but does math exist outside of people being able to write it down? See, that's the question that I'm asking. It's the platonic question. Does math exist outside our reality? Math is just whatever we make up that is consistent. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. These are, you know, these are questions people debate. <clears throat> okay, so, yeah, we're not going to answer that today. Uh, so finally, we reached the next and important definition of a covering map. Definition, um, well, rather a lift. Let, let P from E to X be covering map. All right. Um, y, a topological space. All right. Great. And F, a continuous map from Y to x. And he says, for later developments, it will be important to determine whether there exists a map G. Well, let's just say, if there exists G going from y to e, such that composed with G is equal to F, then G is a lift um, of F. So here's a picture. Here's a picture of this, because you can state this notion in terms of a diagram. It probably makes it more rememberable, if you will. So here's the y, and we've got some mapping f that goes over to x, right? We've got a covering space of x, e, and here's our covering map, p, going from e down to x, and then a lift in this situation is like this. If you can find a, a mapping G that makes this diagram commute, then G is said to be a lift of F. So what does this diagram commute mean? So the diagram commuting means P composed, see P composed with G would be like this, right? And F go like that. More often than not, 
the way this is used is not just for any old um, y. What do we usually have y be? What's that? Some base point? Well, no, 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 no. What y usually is, is just the unit interval. Our most interesting application, really, for the moment at least, is when this is equal. Now, this is not part of the definition, but in terms of thinking about this, why this is an interesting concept, is what does this mean? What would a mapping f from 0, 1 into x be? This is a path, right? So if you lift f, what did you, what's that give you? You take a path in x to a path in the covering space. All right, so that, that's why that's interesting. Let me write some lemmas down for us. I'm not going to prove anything because I think if I state the lemmas and I get back to our pictures, we may still have hope to, to make the point that needs to be made today while well, this is all fresh on our minds. And these going through the details of these proofs will keep us from that for sure. It's still debatable whether we're going to get to it. I'm going to try though. Lemma 5.1. So here's the deal. We have P going from E to X covering map. Come on. And Y connected topological space, right? F a map And suppose um, G and H are both lips of F. All right. Here it is. If g of y is equal to h of y for some point, just one will do, y and y, then g equals to h. So if two lifts match up at even one point, they're the same lift. Does this apply to the context that I was talking about? Is 0, 1 a connected space? It is, right? So one impact of this lemma is to say that if we lift a path in X, right, to a point up here, to a path in the covering space, and we lift another um, and we, look, we somehow have two lifts, right, and they both agree at some point in the covering space, then those two paths must be the same path, in fact. Um, okay, so that's lemma 5.1. Proof's about a half page. Theorem 5.2, path lifting theorem. Let E from, um, I'm sorry, I've got to find a marker that's not dying on me. Theorem 5.2, here we go. Pass lifting theorem, let P, E to X be covering map. And gamma 
from 0 to 1 into x a path. And E naught, an element of E, satisfy P of E naught equal to gamma of zero. Then there exists a unique path alpha from zero one into E such that alpha of 0 is equal to E0 and P composed with alpha equal to gamma. I think it's worthwhile to try to draw a picture of this theorem, even if we don't prove it, right? So what's the idea here? Covering map. Um, and I'm, I'm going to draw the picture for the covering space a little bit more sort of vaguely. I'm going to draw the covering space kind of like a, like a cube. And I'm going to draw the, the space down here that we're covering like that, right? And I'm supposing that, uh, gamma from 0 to 1 is a path. So over here, 0, 1, right? And so This is my gamma, right? And this is, I mean, this right here is gamma of zero, right? Whatever that point is. Uh, what else? E naught is a point in E, so I would picture E naught like over here. Because I picture the fibers over the base space as kind of being Right, like it, the thing that my picture doesn't do justice is it doesn't capture the uh, the disjointness of the right. My picture is more like your retraction in that the, my my picture is not quite the right picture really. Oh, oh, you're right. So I should just make it a stack of pancakes, something like that. Yeah, people do that. Um, so. P of, the point is P of E naught goes like this, right? So P of E naught equals to gamma of zero. Then there exists a unique lift, right? The lift alpha, right? Zero, one to E such that it begins at E naught. And I don't know where it goes. It goes somewhere. Like that. Alpha. And P of E naught goes to gamma zero. We don't get to say that the endpoint of gamma is matched by the endpoint of the lift. Okay. So like an interesting example of this could be something like this could be a loop. All right, let me draw it in a different color. The path in the base space in the, in the x, the space which is being covered x, could be a loop. All right, I'll call it gamma 2. And starting at, you know, starting at 0, starting at gamma of 0, gamma 2 of 0 being equal to gamma just for the sake of discussion, When you lift that loop, you don't necessarily get a loop. That's the thing, is the process of the path lifting, it could do, I, I don't know where it goes to, I mean, I'm not sure exactly, but, you know, there's, there's some lift and it doesn't have to lift to a loop. Although my picture isn't quite right because it does have to 
do like that, I think. Because the, if the, the end point and the initial point are shared like they are for a loop, then the inverse image under the covering map has to go up to that discrete spectrum above the fiber, right? So the, the endpoints have to lie on that fiber over the point. That's the thing is I can't, it, the loop can't just end anywhere. It does have to end somewhere above the, um, the fiber over gamma zero. All right. But you can prove that there's a unique path. This is the path lifting theorem. And we, we may come back and prove the, these theorems in detail. If I, if I, I have to check our schedule, see if we have time or not. But if we do, I'll come back and prove them most likely. Um, let's see here, time, 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 time. Theorem 5.3. Uh, let's see here. Do I even want to write it? Let P be a covering map and let's see, I have to write it, I have to write it down because it'll help me find the words to tell you what this theorem is saying. What's this? F going from, what kind of mapping is this? F going from 0, 1 across 0, 1 into x. What's that? Yeah, it could be a homotopy, right? E naught and E satisfy um, P of E naught equal to F of 0, 0. Then there exists unique lift G from 0, 1, across 0, 1, to E, such that um, G of 0, 0 is equal to E naught. What's this saying? He says, actually, one can, here's the paragraph that precedes that theorem. He says, actually, one can lift a family of paths depending continuously on a parameter. So that the lifted paths also depend continuously on the parameter. A version of this principle, which suffices for, for purposes as follows. What he's saying is that the homotopy lifts in a certain sense. Yep. It looks like a generalization of what? Yeah, I think so. I think that's fair. Yeah, the proof here actually, yes, and I do think there is, you're right, there, there are higher dimensional analogs of this theorem as well. Um, but if you look at the proof, it actually uses 5.2 and some systematic thievery. Um, so what then he does is he... He argues that this allows us, and so we're just about out of time, so I'll just get to the point here. The theorem is basically this, 5.4. Um, if we have P, a mapping from a pointed space E, E, to X, B, with, um, you know, that's the covering space, and suppose that E is simply connected. E simply connected, then phi, which I'll define shortly here, is a one-to-one -one correspondence of the fundamental group of x based at b and the fiber 
over b. And then he goes on in the remainder of the section, which will we'll, you know, be on for another hour at least, to explain that in fact it's more than just a one-to-one -one correspondence, it's a homomorphism. This phi, well, I mean phi is the mapping. He explains how to do it in the paragraphs leading up to this theorem. But it's really almost exactly what I've already done in the picture. So I can, I can somewhat hand wavily tell you, not completely that much of a jump from where we are in the book, We've proved that the inverse image under the covering map of the circle is the integers, right? So what that's basically what you can, you can prove here after you sort through the rest of the details is that the fundamental group of the circle is up to isomorphism, the integers. And the homotopy classes which form that fundamental group are labeled by the winding numbers of the, of the loops in the circle. So the, if you loop around a circle, you can loop once in the counterclockwise fashion that corresponds to the equivalence class labeled by one. If you loop once in the clockwise fashion, that corresponds to the equivalence class labeled by minus one. If you take the circle and you go, whoop, whoop, that's a two. If you go counterclockwise two times, then that corresponds to the integer two, right? And so that, that's the mechanics of the homotopy classes. They geometrically correspond to winding numbers, how many times your loop has actually gone around the circle, right? Um, but from the, the theory of covering maps and so forth, it also is because it corresponds directly to the fiber over, over the circle like that. And the thing is over here, you can look at <clears throat> that picture and understand why the fundamental group is not abelian over here. He, he looks at, I'll, I'll draw a picture down here, but he looks like, so on the one hand he's got alpha, on the other hand this loop he calls beta, and he argues that you can see that the homotopy class alpha times homotopy class beta is not equal to the homotopy class beta times the homotopy class alpha. And he, 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 he makes that, he makes that explicit by sorting through the covering map idea. So like, I, I can't quite get to it today, but there's a picture on page 128 which tries to really explain why those are not equal. As he mentions, the, you can actually prove that the uh, fundamental group on the figure eight space is the, the free group on two generators, which is not non-abelian and infinite and an example which I never gave you in group theory. So if you didn't take group theory, you're not missing out on anything. Because I, I said like no words about, well, I said hardly a word about words in, in group theory, so. Oh no, AB is not equal to BA, right? So like ABBA is not equal to BABA. I mean, ABBA is, ABBA is equal to ABBA, you know? So, I mean, there, it's not to say that you can't write different words different ways, but like the free group on two generators is something like, I don't know, what, what do you want to use your notation for it? It's AB, it's, it's all the words you can write in AB and their inverses. So it's, I mean, a, B, 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 is an element. You can write down its inverse. Right? The identity is the empty word. Right? So.
I guess that's uh, well. Anyway, I should I should not should not make uh, comments about words that are empty. So, let's see here. All right. Anyway, so that's a good place to stop. We have much more to say about path lifting and the concept of covering maps. I want to try to really just kind of park the course here for a day or two and make sure we kind of like absorb this. It has really, really fascinating applications to vector fields and like distinguishing vector fields. I mean, there's the applications to the fundamental group at the end of this chapter are really kind of surprising, I think, and help you to start understanding why people care about topology. It's not just, you know, making abstract definitions to punish students. It's much more than that. Solving problems that if you were stuck in your epsilon delta classical analysis way of thinking, you would, you'd still be stuck there. Or you'd have to be somebody like Groth and Deke or whatever to, to crack it. I, is, it, is it easier to, I think if you can think of it abstractly, it allows you to use theorems that people who are more clever than you have developed. And so it allows you to find solutions to problems that maybe you wouldn't find. Because that theorem is incredibly technical. So when you use that, when you find a way to abstract your problem so that you can use a deep theorem, that may be a way to run around what in your current notation would be something truly horrible. Yeah, but there, there, it's a double-edged sword, right? Sometimes we abstract things and we use some powerful tool when we could have just done like a two-line non-abstract proof. I mean, it's, it's, it's not for the faint of heart, right? I mean, there's, it's dangerous. It shouldn't be practiced by people who are not initiated into our ways. Right? This is why you're getting an education in mathematics so that you can become part of a secretive cult who knows how to use these tools. Don't tell anyone, though. Otherwise, they'll get our jobs. And the king will murder us. <laughs> well, fortunately, we don't have that problem at the moment. Right? <laughs>